So I'm going to turn it over to Matt Griffin, uh, who is Director of Community for Ultimaker, and he's going to be talking about designing for FDM 3D printing. Excellent. So let's see here. Uh, do you all see my slides? We do. Excellent. Cool. Okay. Well, uh, thanks to uh, 3D Universe and Vitspace uh, for including Ultimaker in this great event. It's really fun doing an event with you all. Uh, so today I'm giving actually two sessions. This is the first one focusing on design for FFF uh, or FDM. I'll, I'll explain that in a second. And uh, the second one's on 3D printing materials. And so to save time, I'm going to try to save a lot of the key material related considerations to later. But just remember, anytime you are designing for 3D printing, you're designing for process, materials is always super, super critical. Uh, but I think, you know, knowing that is why Jeremy uh, wanted me to do both the talks. Okay, Oop, I need to activate the right window so I can advance my slide. There you go. Okay, there's me. Uh, so I'm Matt Griffin, Director of Community Development for Ultimaker. Uh, I've been in the desktop 3D printing field since the very beginning, back in uh, 2019, uh, 2009, I wrote 2019 in my notes, uh, as a part of the original team at MakerBot, evangelizing the emerging, at that time, market of specifically desktop 3D printing. 3D printing's been around 35 years by now, uh, but desktop is a new thing. Uh, then I uh, headed to uh, Adafruit, and uh, Make Magazine and did a lot in this space of trying to uh, encourage folks to find this, this new uh, explosion of innovation happening in this space and take advantage of this technology, use uh, 3D printing in combination with electronics, uh, really you know, master how you can use this in your work, and then joined the Ultimaker team in, um, you know, in 2015 when uh, we started a territory organization for North America. We've always had customers here, in fact, they launched uh, at a um, event in Brooklyn that I was helping to throw for MakerBot in 2010. So uh, really great, uh, great folks. So um, I serve Ultimaker's professional, industrial, and educational community in a few ways, including doing a global webinar series that you might have seen or signed up for in the past. We, we do one every single month, probably do more in the future. Uh, and uh, conference events like this and community events all over, working with our customers in whatever context that they are working, whether professional or uh, within uh, universities and high schools. Uh, and uh, launching a talking additive podcast series on Tuesday. So you, you're, this group here is among the first hearing about this, but watch on Tuesday for this launching. I think it should be uh, quite fun. Okay, so. Uh, we're going to start our discussion design here. Oh, actually, ah, I killed one of my slides. Um, there are a number of technologies for 3D printing, additive manufacturing. And in truth, there, is, uh, there are design considerations, uh, constraints and opportunities, material and processing needs for all of them. So we're going to talk about this in terms of FFF, FDM, uh, and in truth, uh, even uh, looking among the various options for this technology, there are considerations depending on how the uh, designer of the equipment and software you're using uh, has made certain decisions. Um, for those who aren't aware, uh, FFF and FDM are the same thing. FDM, uh, Fused Deposition Modeling, is, uh, is the trademark term. FFF is the generic term. And FFM is, a, is another option floating out there in the world that's emphasis on manufacturing. And uh, it involves you know, extruding material, building your object up from the ground, uh, but there's some unique considerations. So uh, before jumping to some of those considerations, this model that you may remember from, uh, from Greg's uh, talk earlier uh, is one of the things that we, we use to remind ourselves how uh, our technology is used uh, by designers and engineers. You're, you're really not just you know, clicking a button and suddenly you have a thing. You are designing for a process. And that is an opportunity, but also the process to intervene at any stage, uh, how you prepare that model, how you, uh, what do you do with the model once you print it. Um, and that also comes into the option to iterate, to learn something from the physical version of what you're making, put that back in the digital domain and go back around the, the circuit again uh, refining and getting closer to what you're doing. Um, here is a really handy thing you might have seen online from 3D Hubs, uh, a poster where they, they sort of picked, uh, they collected what generally the field sees as sort of the key considerations for designing for um, additive manufacturing technologies, and they made a nice big grid. 
And so it has uh, the, um, you know, a bunch of technologies. We're only concerned about the top, uh, you know, line here. And um, we won't go into all of these, but it's, it's useful to look at this. I'm going to mostly focus on uh, items that are a little bit more counterintuitive. Uh, but you see some of the some of the classic options like minimal wall thickness, uh, overhang, support considerations, uh, fine feature considerations, bridging holes. Uh, so, like I said, we won't have time to do all. But if you are interested, uh, ping me, ask questions, and if enough of you are interested, I will uh, do an hour-long version of the content we're going to do next um, to 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 give you more design for FFF uh, solutions. So. Let's take a look here. So here is the same model uh, done with different layer heights and that uh, really fast option there, the one hour 46 minute version uh, is also using a 0.8 core. And so I always like to start with this because um, really deciding what your project criteria are is where you start as a designer. Uh, and you may be thinking about this question right here before you've done anything in CAD. What are you actually trying to do? Now, uh, there's a huge range of time from less than two hours to over seven hours for the same part. If you really just need like a, a sense of that volume and to kind of roughly compare it to where you want to place it, um, why spend over seven hours pr producing it? Now, I had mentioned the Talking Additive uh, podcast series. Uh, the first episode is with uh, Matthew Forrester from L'Oreal. And he pointed out something I thought was pretty critical. He was saying that um, there's been some confusion about you know, what you should worry about, how you should think about making a parts in the past, uh, largely because um, 3D printing parts uh, was sort of in the domain of the service bureaus. So you had to make a pretty beautiful looking part uh, in order to persuade the person you're giving it to, that you've sold it to, that they've received a good part. But if you are making that part, if you're trying to solve an actual problem for your business, that's not how you make the decisions. You don't necessarily need a very fine, fancy part for solving everything. He was pointing out so many opportunities where internally they will spend far less time, make it a, you know, an ugly part, race through to a solution that gives them the information they need to move forward through design or to solve something in automation. And that is a much better solution. And it ends up saving time and uh, iteration costs in such a way that um, you, you really get more value. Um, OK, so I'm going to, so what this really comes down to is product requirements. And there's a lot of considerations here. Like here's an example of a bunch of things that have um, really, you know, each of these uh, projects have very specific and separate uh, goals, such as, you know, uh, well, and, and then that one in the bottom right is sort of key. Uh, it was an experiment to do a sensor mount in an engine, but using material that wasn't uh, compatible, so it burned up. So, you know, you want to find out what that key requirement is. And, uh, you know, when you're thinking of things like strong, like, oh, I need a tough part. Well, is it, is it engineering toughness? Is it abrasive resistant, chemical resistant? Does it need to be really stiff? Thinking about those things before you even start in CAD is critical. And a lot of this really comes into play when you see all the material options. So we'll talk about this uh, a little bit later. Um, but I wanted to point out this. Now, Jeremy's going to do a Cura talk. So I won't uh, sort of you know, give away all the, the, the stories of Cura. But I want to point out uh, this sort of grid that shows uh, four different areas sort of pulling, you know, making a decision, you know, which element you're going to really emphasize in the, uh, in this case, in the slicing. Uh, you do the same thing as a designer when you're designing your, your project itself. Um, but this helped us identify that we could start offering intent profiles uh, where you really set the processing instructions up to match the goal of what you have in mind. And I, I really think designers should always have this in mind. We had a, a pretty good you know, standard profile that was bending much more towards the visual aspect. We liked that we made these beautiful parts, but guess what? That's not what everybody needs. And so uh, we wanted to uh, you know, make sure to offer, like t Tom's uh, projects he was talking about in investment casting, you really need the accuracy. You need to target certain things that are compatible with that process far more than you need it to just be pretty on its own. 
So some of the tricks to make a surface pretty, not useful for that. Um, also this part uh, on view here, not super beautiful, uh, but it does exactly what's needed and it's modular and uh, parts that are broken and should be broken because a really heavy use part can easily be slotted in. Uh, so this is, again, this is not about like what monolithic part, you know, can I, can my machine make a monolithic part that's, you know, perfect for all views? No, don't, don't, this, don't solve things that way. Solve in terms of things you need to solve, such as accuracy, operating environment. Think about ergonomics, post-processing, you know, really suit yourself to, to the needs. So here are the seven key areas when you're thinking of optimizing uh, a design for printing. And so I'll use this sort of guide the last uh, couple of slides here. One is the nozzle thickness. Remember earlier in the slide when I showed uh, the option that was really fast uh, by printing with 0.8 core? Um, so it's, it can be like drawing with a, like a thick crayon instead of a fine uh, you know, pen, but you still have the same positional accuracy. So it can really be a great solution. Um, but there are considerations with things like this. When you want to get out to the, if you, if you look at the, the item here on the, on the far right, you really aren't going to get the sharpest of points when you go to a thicker nozzle. In fact, in, in this technology in general, you're not going to get an infinitely sharp point. Uh, you're going to be, you're moving a, a um, extruder uh, to make that angle turn. It's going to round a little bit. And depending on the, you know, the size of the nozzle, it's going to affect that rounding. So have that consideration when you're making the outer profile of your design. Um, also, uh, think about your design in terms of, you know, easy ad adhesion to the plate. Uh, and avoid things like the, the rounded fillets. They're, they're really beautiful, industrial design parts, not really compatible uh, to this approach. Um, and, and speaking of the, you know, the 45 degree angle that was mentioned on the previous side, um, you can take advantage that this technology, as you move up at a 45 degree angle, you can still get some pretty nice adhesion. So you don't need support uh, for something at 45 minutes. So you can use that uh, to guide elements of your design to reduce the amount of support you need. And so you can use this also if you need to execute uh, you know, various types of industrial design finish uh, for visualizing a product, you can plan it out in terms of that and reduce your requirements. Um, you, can all, you can do bridging, uh, just you know, be aware. So with bridging, you, uh, you, you can have an unsupported long uh, span uh, if it's anchored on both sides. Um, but, you know, depending on your part, you know, think about whether it would be better to have a support element in there. Uh, if you're printing fast, you can use this trick uh, to allow you to get, you know, a cap and that kind of thing and not care. And uh, there are other considerations that you, you might have, you know, they're familiar, but they're used in different ways. And if you were designing uh, plastic parts and other technologies, you could add ribs. You can add uh, other, other ways to kind of distribute load where you join uh, you know, a, a, a tall spindly part to a flat surface uh, and avoid that easy shear break possibility when you just have a cylinder coming off of a surface. Let's speed through these to make sure we can wrap out. Um, and just so tolerances in general, uh, something to think about, uh, the orientation of your part really affects uh, how accurate you can uh, suit the part that you're making to a, like a place you want to attach it to. So when you, you're printing two different parts that need to interface, uh, it's nice to, uh, you know, just chop out the part, you're going to interface them, uh, test them out. You may find that you need them both oriented with a similar way of thinking so that they uh, match together. That's, that's a very handy trick. Now, I think I will wrap there. There is a lot of exciting stuff that you can do with this. So if there's interest, I'd love to do a longer version of this. So th thank you very much.